Hi guys and welcome to the Carla Garrick Show. I'm delighted to be in studio as you can see today, a little bit of a change because I have a guest for a change. So I'm super, super excited to introduce Therese Grinnell. She is someone who I discovered on this crazy COVID journey over the past two years. And everyone who knows me knows, you know, I'm someone who believes in, uh, you know, lead by example, get out there and let people know what you're doing. Don't tell people to do something if you're unwilling to do it yourself. And so Therese is someone I've just run across that I actually deeply admire because she was out there doing the health freedom stuff. Her background is a nurse. But then from there, she's just sort of been empowered, like truly empowered. She got arrested, and we'll get into that. Uh, was in a free speech fight with the governor. I mean, it's just all kinds of drama. Yeah. So it's fascinating, and I'm really, really, really excited to have you here. And the main reason we want her here today is to talk about the Resolve program. But before we get to that, Therese, Tell the folks back home just a little bit about the past two years. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, I, I mean, we were just chatting really quickly. First of all, Carla, thank you so much for this opportunity. I love your energy, and I just love the fact that we live in New Hampshire. We have so many liberty-minded individuals. Like, if anywhere else I'd want to be in the world right now, it's right here. So, um, And you're originally from... California? I, yeah, so I was born and raised in Ojai, California, which is in Ventura County, just north of Los Angeles. And I moved here um, with my high school sweetheart who grew up on the East Coast. And I have a 20 year old daughter. Moved here in 1998. And I remember when I first. I feel like I'm going to go, shut up. Yeah, you don't no, have a 20 year old daughter. I do. <laughs> um, and, you know, growing up, you know, my dad listened to Rush Limbaugh on the way to school. And, and I remember thinking, my brother said, oh, libertarians are, you know, basically let me live my life as as long as I'm not hurting someone. I'm like, well, that's perfect. And my dad's like, no, you need to be registered as a Republican because <laughs> your vote will never count otherwise. So that just gives you a little framework of how I grew up. Um, and I came back here. My father-in-law was in Rhode Island. We came up to Conway to go skiing. And I remember reading in the paper, the neighbor's dog got the neighbor's chicken. I'm like, this is where I want to raise my family. <laughs> like, coming from L.A., I'm like, you know, we're lucky if you're gunshot on the side of the highway and anyone comes to you. <laughs> oh, wow. So, you know, I was like, this is just beautiful here. And then I found out there was no income tax, no sales tax. And it was live free or die. And I was like, that's it. So You're like, I'm on board I, yeah, with the so, value proposition <clears throat> of the free state of New Hampshire. Right. So, you know, that was kind of my experience as far as moved here in 1998. Um, oh, that was, long ago. Yeah. And oh, so I was, you're an old timer. You're I, kind of what we like to call a pre-stater. Maybe a pre-stater. So I didn't even know what pre-stater is, but right. I guess by default I'm, a, I'm one of those. So, we'll claim you, of course. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, and so from there I um, was actually in finance. I worked for Washington Mutual. 9-11 happened. The whole market crashed. They were moving out of state. And I wanted to stay here. So I went back to school and became a registered nurse at age 32. Um, and from there... Um, you know, it was just really busy. I had grown up with my parents, had fostered and adopted for my younger siblings. Oh, so wow, wonderful. I always had it in my heart's desire to get licensed as a foster mom and to take children on when I was in a position to do so. And life circumstances, I ended up with two little boys that came into my story. Um, and so for seven years, went through the DCYF situation with them and actually started a whole ministry for connecting the community with the needs of these kids that were in care. And that's kind of where I was. Um, between working, single mom, getting these two boys adopted. And um, politics always mattered to me, but I, I didn't know about Rebuild. I didn't know what a rhino was. I wasn't. I wasn't what is a rhino, I, Therese? Well, I know now. It's a Republican <laughs> in name only. And I didn't know that when someone was running um, as a Republican candidate that they weren't vetted and that they wouldn't represent the platform. Right. And so I was just kind of always a straight vote. Like, I would just go and, you know, if I didn't know the name, and I wasn't really vetting people out. I wasn't taking the time to understand who they were. Yep. Um, and so people say, well, that's the complacency that got us where we're at. And I get that, but my thing was, you know, I was over here in the foster care world saying, why isn't everyone getting licensed to help these kids and right. getting mad about that? Mm -hmm. You know, so everyone's got their own place. Yep. 
So here I am. Um, and, and, and just to shortly answer that question, although I don't want to get diverted, uh, someone like me who doesn't have children, but who desperately and really wanted children and it just didn't work out for us, you know, we've considered fostering over the years, but I've heard so many nightmare stories that I was just like, you know, I don't think I can invite that level of government into my life it's because it's, it's, and, and so, you know, for folks who watch this show a lot, who know Carla, just, bah, 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 government sucks, government sucks. <laughs> government sucks you know yeah. like you we can't even care for the foster children because of the way the system is set up yeah but that's a, a another aside for another we day. could do another show on that for because sure i could tell you all about dcyf the audit and everything that's going on there that needs to be completely gutted yep. um, it's it's a train wreck but um so non you know long story short here i am a nurse working in the pandemic and i'm having all my friends who are covid recovered not get their exemptions approved and looking at 20 years on the job and they're the primary health care provider you know they carry the insurance for their family and their husband's going through chemo and their kids are at home and they're trying to get to work and just this huge mess and I was like what the heck is going on and I actually marched myself into Water Street the oh, New Hampshire wow. GOP office and I said we have a Republican governor and reps and how is this happening in New Hampshire Right. How are my friends, how are people losing their business? How is it that I can't take my boys to the beach? Like, what the hell is, I don't know if I can say You can, what because that's one of the George Carlin <laughs> words that are not bad. <laughs> so what the heck is going on? Right. And how do I get involved to, you know, figure this out? And uh, and I'll never forget that and talking to Maya, whatever. And from there, I just actually did a poster board. And I'm just going to go stand outside of Dartmouth and say that these firing these people is not okay. And from there, I got catapulted <laughs> into New Hampshire politics. And so uh, here I am, and my sphere of influence is still, you know, the accountant across the street who's busy with her three kids and barely has time to change the kitty litter, who's trying to figure out what the hell is going yep. on and how do we make it right? Yep. And is it too late to save it? Right. And so, you know, you, I think where we met each other was at maybe some of the health freedom marches. Mm -hmm. And then sadly, your activism, much like mine did as well, you know, 12 years ago, I got arrested for, for really just saying, oh, I'm not sure this is okay, but like, let me just, you know, you sometimes feel compelled to just be mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm going to do this because this feels right. And so uh, walk us very briefly through the arrest story. Sure. So, um, I work overnight as a hospice nurse, and there was a call to action for me to be at St. A's that the executive council meeting was uh, voting on some money, and I didn't really even understand what it was, but my phone started blowing up that people had shown up, and there wasn't enough room for the venue for people to get in, and they were upset, and I'm like, okay, let's get in the car, let's go down, and I got there, and someone showed me, did you see this, and that there was a line item that if they accepted that money, they would be obliged to isolate and quarantine anyone the federal government um, felt was a health hazard and in Australia we're seeing people you know being quarantined and stuff and I'm like oh hell no like we can't have this this is not okay like yeah that's my hard money that I send up to Washington and of course I want it back right but not with this in it and and, and of course that is a challenge with any money that the federal government takes from us until very recently uh, probably pre-covid uh, New Hampshire was a net payer to the federal government, which means for folks back home, mm -hmm. we pay more money to the federal government than we as Granite Staters get back from the federal government. Now, with all the funny money and all the money printing and the monetary policy, which causes the inflation and all of that, um, I'm not 100% sure that's true anymore. But part of the challenge and one of the reasons, you know, Granite Staters should think seriously about nullifying bills and nullifying things from the feds is why don't we keep our money and spend our money? Because when we give it to the federal government and they give it back to us, it comes with all these strings and all these bells and whistles. And the mm -hmm. next thing you know, your state isn't even sovereign. Right. I mean, I've always believed if I had $20 and I saw someone who was cold, I'd rather go get them a sweatshirt than send it to Washington and think that it's ever going to come back to him. Right. Right. I mean, basic model. Yep. So I, you know, so, yeah. So from there, you know, people have followed the story. They canceled, um, or I went in and Footloose was really upset and I've gotten to know Footloose and... I could tell from a mile away that he was one of the kids that I've worked with that have aged out of the system. And when I validated that was the case, I'm like, yep. his righteous anger makes total sense to yep. me. And um, just love his his fight. 
Um, but long story short, ended up at the October 13th at the police academy, um, and we were there, and we had all decided we were going to go and sit perfectly silent. We wanted to know where they were going to vote on this money. We'd already made it clear as voters how we felt about it. And to be tapped on the shoulder and brought in the back of the room, the first one of nine, um, I was perfectly silent. They said I was being arrested for being disorderly. I said, what did I do? They didn't ask me to leave. They didn't just give me a ticket. Right. You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my boys are out there and my purse and my phone. And I have to work tonight and like I'm being arrested. So long story short, the criminal complaint didn't come for two weeks and it said that I was um, arrested for disorderly conduct that I said the word amen. And oh, the, wow. the police report said that they heard my voice coming from that direction and they recognized my voice from Facebook. Oh. And that's that's what they oh, wow. are basing this idea. I mean, of course, there's all the video footage. So July 20th is our next hearing. We finally have put in a motion to dismiss. Um, they have not been able to come up with a so bill. So they did not null process. So, so did you, you had an arraignment? Oh, yeah. We've had five. This will be our fifth time in court. Wow. They keep just kicking the can down the road. So, but they haven't dropped the charges. No. So, like, in my case, what happened was they, they charged me with disorderly. Something about, like, I don't know, uh, maligning government administration or something. Oh, some geez. ridiculous charge. And then, of course, added the wiretapping one. But the minute we went to court, they they dropped the charges. I think they realized, ah, this is probably a bit nonsense, so let's just make it go away. Yeah. But, you know, they underestimated who they were dealing with, which I think they've done in this case. Well, the last hearing, they actually changed the charges, and now it's, I recklessly said the word amen. What? Yeah, I kid you not. I'll, I'll show you guys the documentation. It's the most ridiculous. And that's when our we attorney... We should make t-shirts that say reckless amen. amen. So, you know, our attorney is like, I, this is like the best case ever. Like, they're just laughing hysterically. And of course, Footloose is in there as well. So that brings all kinds of... I mean, it's really fun. So if you want to have fun, come July 20th, Concord State House at 1245. We... All rise, no, we sit, you know, we're like, we're not bowing down to this. Wow. And, so. and, and, you know, just to get, sort of get into a little bit of the insider baseball here. So part of the backstory here, of course, is that uh, Governor Sununu doesn't like the criticism that is coming from his own side, so to speak, because um, we're making him look bad. Yep. So his ego's engaged. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, for folks who've been following along, there was that First Amendment issue where he arrested a bunch of people at his home who were protesting in front of his house. That is First Amendment protected speech. Everyone knows it. They did a little shady move where the brother of the governor went and wrote an ordinance after the fact to say that this kind of picketing is just illegal yeah. in this one place. That would not hold up to any kind of constitutional smell test. We all know it. There's no one who looks yeah. good here from the governor's side. Everyone else is just a citizen standing up for their rights. So that was sort of the precursor to some of this. So, so there was this like energy, I guess, in, in the world where, where Governor Sununu was feeling a little put upon. Mm -hmm. And then there was this meeting at the police academy where, uh, you know, I saw some video footage where people were sort of, it, I mean, it looked like it was a targeted, uh, a, a targeted operation on some of the free speech activists who were saying things that they did not like. So... Yeah. Then you decided to solve then, the problem, so right? Now everyone's <laughs> like, you know, he cannot continue to be our governor, you know. And then I find out his brother works for the World Economic Forum, and they're being very bold and brazen about, you know, accelerating Agenda 2030. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, I never went down the rabbit holes. I never, like... You know, I was like, maybe this is happening, not. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, this is truly happening. How oh, it's, do I, we protect New Hampshire? So, so, and and that is a legitimate question, and it's difficult because people struggle with this idea that something that they don't know, like, or are not necessarily seeing in the mainstream legacy mm -hmm. news must be a conspiracy theory. It must not be true somehow, right. right? Because the legacy news isn't reporting on it. But the point is the legacy news can't report on it because they're part of the sort of the, the cabal, for lack of a better right. term, right? So I personally, I follow the WEF's Twitter page. I follow, you know, all all of these, and it's it's shamelessly out there. It's oh, not brazen. a conspiracy theory. Right. There is a group of people 
globalists in the world mm -hmm. who are saying we should create one world government, you know, which honestly, maybe that doesn't even sound so bad, but then think about all the sci-fi movies where the Federation never well, ends up being the good guy. <laughs> they had a fundraiser right in Manchester like a week ago. And oh, I'm like, wow. is this really in New Hampshire? And oh, it really, really is. And, you know, a group of us went down and were engaged in conversation with them. And they truly believe for the, you know, climate change. And actually, I thought back in my nursing school days, I remember our professor saying the baby boomers are going to hit the nursing homes. And it's like $20,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you look at it from a business model, which is what these globalists are doing, they're saying this is dead weight and we need to, you know, in order for better climate and world hunger, and it just makes sense to them to depopulate. And they truly believe that that is an okay, rational thing to do. And that us minions just don't understand it from a, kind of a business viewpoint. Right. right? So and kind of coming from corporate America, they, they really truly are looking at us like livestock. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, you know, because I've been battling this so long, I actually sort of threw up my hands this weekend. I was at a, a, a party, and I was talking to a very good friend of mine who actually has terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said something like, I don't know, man, maybe we should just give up and have socialized medicine. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's just the way to go. And she, like, stopped, and she was, like, horrified. She really took me to mm -hmm. task. And she said, but Carla... If we had socialized medicine, I would not get treatment. I would be told it's too expensive to try and save your life. So tough, you need to go away and die. And that is the flip side that none of these people right. want to talk about when they talk about socialism. In the UK, if you have certain diseases, they're like, sorry, right. we can't treat you it's because it effective. doesn't make a cost-benefit mm -hmm. analysis. That's the reality. And that is inhumane. So if you like like humanity, you should be on our side. Well, and, and you know, we could go down a whole nother idea, like how I feel about healthcare being a nurse, because I think if we took the lobbyist and we, we transformed the insurance and all of the money that's being made, we truly could prolong life in a really healthy way quality of life and affordably so there's a lot of ways there's, there's a even, lot of uh, a lot of business management that needs to happen within our healthcare system but you know when there's money involved and it's know, not that money is evil it's the corporatism right it's right. the capitalism right it's when we take cronyism so we take big government and we take big pharma and you marry them now we have a corporatism where yeah. these guys are all getting rich and all of us are just kind of getting uh shafted so how do we go on the offense yes right so everyone's calling me everyone's starting to shut down like you were let's give up and i'm like no oh and I everyone just understand i like give up for like two minutes and then I'm like, ah, we're back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my nickname is Tenacious Therese and he picked the wrong person to arrest. And so now that I'm aware, I'm a triage nurse. So this is the problem. This needs to be my priority. So how are we going to fix it? And I came up with a very simple, very, very simple idea, guys. And we can do this. So the idea is we have a problem. We need a solution. We're calling it the resolve. And part of the resolve, you look up the definition, it can be used in many ways. Um, so Garth's given us a great uh, marketing tool. We're resolved to go the distance. We resolve not to give up. We resolve to unite. We resolve to take it back. And we resolve to be on the, um, on the offense versus being one of their minions, right? And all we have to do is come together. So I sat down with this idea and how do we take this back? And I started looking at New Hampshire's numbers. And I was like, wow, if we had 100 people who were really determined, go get 10 more people who are truly liberty-minded, and they get 10 people, and they get 10 people, and we get outside of the framework of doing it by money, or having to bow down to the establishment, or getting WMUR, or all these others, these deep, deep pockets of these individuals who do not want us to say game over. If we just collectively came together, we would have the numbers to put a civilian legislative body at our state house. It's that simple. And so this was birthed in my head out in the barn with my horse <laughs> in April. And I said, okay, I'm going to go get 100 people in April. May, we're going to have 1,000. June, we're going to have 10,000. July, we're going to have 100,000. July, we're going to do debates. We're going to choose who we feel is principled and truly for the people, by the people. And then in August, we're going to pull everyone who's participating who they like the most. And that's going to be our lineup. And in September, we're going to knock everyone out of that state house who's not for the people, by the people. And that was it. 
that wow. simple. And we met April's goal within 48 hours. <laughs> We've nice. exceeded, today's June 1st, we exceeded May's goals. Um, we have everyone who's participating. We have a graphic designer who is a disabled vet who is extremely talented. I actually had someone reach out and say, who's backing you financially? Because there's no way that the quality of this campaign commercial oh, wasn't cool. paid for. And I said, oh, it was the creation of a very talented disabled vet who is in this fight. And then we have a patriot who is, or a liberty-minded person who owns a print shop. And he said, I will do everything at cost. Nice. And so we came up with our branding. And um, same with my website. There was someone who stood with me at one of the events and said, you can't do this on Facebook anymore. I'm building you a website. So she's got it all locked down with her own server. She is like the most security-minded person ever. She won't send anything to me by email anymore (laughs) because I'm not secure at home. Um, But we basically decided we're going to collect up an email and a zip code, and that creates you're then a participant in the Resolve initiative. We do an open Zoom call every Sunday for people to ask questions and get understanding. And then I took all my liberty-minded friends, Derek, Ann Cobb, Kelly, people who have been in the New Hampshire politics for a very, very long time. Um, people who have stood up that I have seen God to bat and say, we need an independent investigation of the nine of you that were arrested. Um, Dr. Strang, Paul Terry, Mark Allegro, just people that have come forward and already demonstrated to me that I can trust them, working on who, who are these names and who are these people. But then what happened? I had a call from Thad Riley and said, Therese, I need $10,000 to do a commercial and I'm going to need 800000 to make it to the primaries against Sununu, Karen Testerman, you know, all these individuals talking about the money. Um, Julian, I need 150000 to get in front of Corey to get an endorsement from Trump. And I'm sitting here going, this is insane. Mm. The money involved mm. in this is insane. Uh, someone who would be a really good legislator, will you go run up against Sununu or will you run for state senate or executive council member? And they're like, I'm not going to spend refinance my house, spend 300000 only for the establishment to claim that I cheated on my wife or to lose my business mm-hmm. or to this or to that. And not yeah, only it's pretty that, dirty out there. I not lie. only that, I don't want to be <laughs> up there if I'm the only one up there. Right. Because I don't want to be part of this global agenda. Yep. I don't like the direction this is going in. And what do we say? We have really good people that get up there and then they get swept out to the tide because they have to do the go along to get along to get anything done. So in my head, if we got the top 30 positions all filled with people who are truly good legislators and principled and for the people by the people, they would stay true. Because they wouldn't be the only person up there. And of course we we have over the years, we were talking about this before the show, just sort of talking about how liberty-minded people who chose New Hampshire as their forever home have sort of been laying this groundwork, right, where we can say, oh, okay, we know we have organizations that actually do look at people's voting records and kind of go, yay, nay, mm, you suck, right? right? So we do have a lot of those things. And so I think this is almost like a next level can you help me understand though because mm-hmm. one of the things I was hearing uh, this was probably bad marketing but I was like ooh like a Ponzi scheme for liberty right or a, a multi-level marketing yeah. scheme right where every right. person gets someone else but as opposed to those things which are exploitative this is literally trying to build bigger groups of people who who are liberty forward who, who right. have principles who say you know even when it's not comfortable, you kind of have to say no. These are the people who lost their jobs because they were unwilling to get uh, inoculated or a forced vaccination against either their religion, their principles, their health. Maybe they'd had COVID and were like, "Ah, I think I've got natural immunity. I don't want this, right? So those kinds of people. Help me understand, is this a write-in campaign so, or? Yeah. So um, basically, you know, we do have the NHLA scorecards. We have other scorecards we're using. We have libertyballot.com. Yep. Like, we have some really good tools that have already been there. Like if I would have known about libertyballot.com in years past, I so would have used that. 
Yeah, and for so, folks, like blowing that out. It's libertyballot.com and that basically will tell you who to vote for if you care about liberty so you can just go there. I have used it literally in it's the beautiful. in the in the booth be like, "Oh, I don't know about this person, you know." You, you just and, put down your town and it tells you like who yep. who they vetted. And so anyways, we've got all these great tools here in New Hampshire. So, what is the Resolve initiative um, to back up on the Ponzi scheme piece of it? So my grandmother <laughs> sold Avon and I hate like this whole idea pampered chef I hate all of those and so I was like Lord really I don't want to you know and he's like well, do you not remember what I did with 12 people and you know come on you can you, everyone knows 10 people a month right and so and we've made it really easy we have um Nathan, who has the print shop, came up with a business card that speaks very pithy, quickly to the resolve and the QR code. And people are leaving those everywhere, gas stations, at the meat counter, at the grocery stores, mm -hmm. you know, and, and handing those out and saying, hey, just go look at this. So the reality is, is we have a workbook with all of our elected in it, um, including the state reps by county. Um, and we are looking at their scorecards. We're looking at who they are, who, are they the principal, who's running up against them. The next two weeks to June 10th, we're going to continue to be working that workbook very, very diligently every day. There's a whole team on that. If someone is a good individual and they have gone the right way, we are, we are going to be the wind in their sail. OK, if someone is going to run and they're principled and, and they're going to do the traditional campaign, we are going to recommend that everyone you know, go that direction for that person. The only place we were thinking that we would write someone in is after June 10th, we look across and go, oh, dear Lord, nobody went up against this person mm -hmm. and they have demonstrated there for the global agenda. That is not okay. We need to actively go find someone in that district to primary them, even if we have to collectively assemble the vote and have enough people to write them in and have it be successful. Okay. So that's where it started. So I rolled that out, and what did the voter integrity group do? Because mm -mm. we had all the machine concerns. <laughs> they said, why don't we write everyone's name in? Because then it has to go through the machine, and then it has to be forced to be hand counted. Oh, interesting. And so those who were concerned about the machines said, why don't we do that? But, and so that was just the icing on the cake. Anyone can choose, you can choose what you're most comfortable with with that. But I said, if we're going to do that, then we need to have a part of this strategic plan also mm. be a large group of us inserting ourselves as volunteers at the polls. So I've already signed up to be investigator of the voter role for my town, and we have a contact. So everyone who's participating participating in the resolve is also being charged with you need to also sign up to be there in your polls to make sure if we do do the hand count we actually have it count and looked at um, the right way so this is very multifaceted is very much everyone has to get up and do, do but if you can find two people that you think are um, all about saving liberty here in new hampshire that's all you need. And if we did that, we'd have over 400,000 participants in September. Wow. Where we only had 120,000 people participate in the primaries in 2020. So we have three times what we need if we simply assemble. The and numbers are there. And the numbers are there because uh, we're going to run up against the clock here. But the numbers are there because the largest voting block of people in New Hampshire are not Republicans and they are not Democrats. They are the undeclared people who swing the votes in this state. And if you care about New Hampshire and if you care about our futures and if you care about what is happening in this country, this is your call to action that we have to come out and we're all going to have to do a little. We can't just sit on the sidelines anymore. The time has come where you have to actually resolve to rise up. Yeah. So and this will not split the vote because we're going to do our own poll in August and I'll be able to report to you 80% of you like candidate B. Are we all going to point and shoot at candidate B? I liked candidate A, but B is still better than the alternative of who's there. And then we can consolidate and be much more effective. So you're going to be a more knowledgeable voter. You're going to participate in giving us who you like. So you're part of the decisioning process. It's not the trace line up. It is we the people coming together and deciding who we want legislating for us without money buying our vote and name recognition. We cannot do it that way this year. Awesome. So just to let everyone know where they can oh, learn sure. more. So to sign up, it's we the people in h.org. You'll see a tab there for the resolve. There's a promo commercial you can watch. Email us if you have questions, kick the tires, poke holes in it. Um, but we the people in h.org.
Wonderful. Thank you so yeah, much for joining you, me. Thank you for being here. Thanks to all the folks back yes. home. Remember to this. check out uh, all the content. You can go to CarlaGarrick.com. I post all the nonsense I do there. So please go take a look and I will see you guys again next week. Thanks, guys.